Everything you need to know about work and energy is written here on this page. So what I want you all to do is I want you to pause the video, jot all of this down, we'll talk about it, and then we're going to run through a couple examples. Okay, so the way that I do conservation of energy, the way that I like to set it up, is you're going to go U1 plus K1 is equal to U2 plus K2 plus any work done by friction. Now what U represents, U represents your potential energy, and you're going to have two different types of potential energy. You'll have a potential energy due to gravity, which will be MGH, and so if you're some height above the ground, then uh, that'll be that, and then the potential energy of a spring is one-half kx squared. And so if your spring is stretched or compressed, then it'll have potential energy. Kinetic energy is one-half mv squared, and, the work, and that's if you have any movement, and the work done by friction is the force of friction times a distance d. Now, if you want, um, you could go through a full free body diagram sum of forces in order to find your normal force, but in general, the, if you're on a flat surface, the normal force is going to be m times g, and in general, if you're on a ramp with an angle theta, that normal force will be an mg cosine theta. So that's just kind of a shortcut that works 99% of the time. All right? The only time it wouldn't work is if you have other external forces pushing up or down on it. Now let's talk about work real quick. Okay, well, for conservation of energy, before I talk about work, all I'm going to do is I'm going to see what's going on in the beginning. That's your u1 and k1. I'm going to see what's going on in the end. That's u2 and k2. And then as for the work done by friction, I'm going to see is friction involved in this problem. If it is, then I go mu n times the distance traveled over it. And if it isn't, then I don't bother. Okay, so what you'll do is you'll just start plugging and chugging, and it becomes pretty easy. But let's talk about work. I know that y'all have been given the equation, work is force times distance. And I'm like, well, yeah, it is if it's constant. There's a couple of asterisks that I want to put by it. Work, in general, is force times distance. But if you have a non-constant force, you need to integrate it. Okay? And so work would be the integral of the non-constant force. Another thing you need to be aware of with um, work being force times distance, I want to make a note of it, is you need to take the force or the component, the component of F that points in the direction of motion. Here's what I mean by that. Let's do a really quick free body diagram of a block on a ramp, and let's focus just on gravity just for a quick second. Gravity's pointed straight down, but you're not going to do mg times the distance traveled. That would not be the work done by gravity, because if this block is sliding down the ramp, that positive x direction would be uh, parallel to the ramp and pointed downwards. And so what would happen is you would have to find the component of the force that actually does work. Notice how the opposite component, the mg sine theta, this is actually the component that does the work. It's a component of the gravity that points in the direction of motion. Okay, so make sure that y'all know that. Um, another thing you have to be aware of is do I do positive or negative work? Because gravity sometimes is positive, gravity sometimes is negative. And it really depends on does it help or does it oppose the motion. If that force is helping that motion, like this block was sliding downwards, this work done by gravity would be positive because it's assisting in that motion. But if the block was moving upwards, gravity would be opposing that motion Hence why it would do negative work. So that's where the positive and negatives come from. Finally, one of the most important equations in all of physics is that the net work done on a system is equal to that system's change in kinetic energy. Now the way you calculate the net work done on a system is you're going to add up all the works done by all of the forces. And then your change in kinetic energy is literally your final kinetic energy, one-half mvf squared, minus your initial, which is one-half mv naught squared. So what I want to do next is I want to do a conservation of energy problem, and then I want to do some a work problem. That way you can see how all of this is utilized. So let's take a look here at number one. So for number one, what it says, it says we have a nasty T-sip of a mass m slides down a frictionless hill that is some height h on 6th street 
with an initial velocity v0. The t sub then travels through a horizontal rough patch, a distance d. Okay, so here's going to be a horizontal rough patch, a distance d, before it hits the spring with a force constant k. The rough patch has a known coefficient of friction mu. Okay, part a says, what is the speed of the t sip when it reaches the bottom of the hill? So in part a, at the bottom, what is that velocity? Now there is no friction along that hill, so we'll just be aware of that. And so in part a, I'm going to go u1 plus k1 equals u2 plus k2 plus any work done by friction. Okay, initially, you do have potential energy. Initially, I am some height h above the ground. So it would be mgh. And initially, I have kinetic energy. And so plus 1 half mv naught squared. Now, in the end, here on the ground, uh, your height above the ground, of course, would be zero, so you have no potential energy. Your kinetic energy, that final velocity, is actually what I'm looking for. This is going to be 1 half mv f squared. And then finally, there was no friction on the hill, it was frictionless, so work done by friction would be zero. And once you slotted that out, you just do a little bit of algebra to solve for VF. And if you do your algebra correctly, your VF would be the square root of 2GH uh, plus that V naught squared. Multiply the 2, divide by M, and take the square root of both sides. Okay, so that's going to be part A. Part B says, okay, how far does it compress the spring? And so again, let's go u1 plus k1 equals u2 plus k2 plus any work done by friction. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the initial portion still the top. That way, in case this was the only question asked, you'd still know how to deal with it. So at the top, again, I have an initial potential energy of mgh. And it had an initial velocity of 1 half mv naught squared. Now, in the end, when it compresses that spring, write this for part b, how far does it compress that spring? The potential energy is no longer due to gravity. But because you're compressing that spring, that spring has potential energy. And the potential energy of a spring it's 1 half kxf squared. That xf is what I'm looking for. Now, if I want to see its maximum compression, its momentary, the velocity is going to be momentarily zero. That'll be the moment right as it stops. And so that's why the kinetic energy at the end would be zero. And then friction was involved. It actually, you know, went through some friction in distance d with the coefficient of friction mu. So what this would be, this would be my force of friction, so mu times n, and because I'm on a flat surface, that n is going to be m times g. So it'll be mu mg times that distance d that it traveled. And once I've slotted everything, you just do a little bit of algebra to solve for that xf. And so subtracting that over, doing all the math and so forth, that xf, if you do your math correctly, will be the square root of 2 over k times, and then mgh, plus 1 half mv naught squared minus mu mgd. And that would be it. And that would be your final answer. Now there is one last thing that I want to talk about real quick though. And that's when you do have your final answer, make sure it logically makes sense. What I mean by that is, let's take a look at this k. Imagine the k was really large at a really strong spring. Well that k was really large, that x would be you know, really small, which that logically makes sense, right? If it's a strong spring, it ain't going to push you very far. And let's take a look at these. Let's say that height was really high. Let's say that velocity was really fast. Both of those would increase the x, which makes sense. The higher you start or the faster you go, of course, the more it's going to push you. And let's take a look at this friction. If the friction was stronger, if that distance that the friction was was longer, then, you know, it would decrease the x, which again, mathematically and logically makes sense. There was this one exam, whenever I took physics uh, as a student, I had all this work done, and I actually had that as, like, similarly, I had a plus mu mgd. 
and I couldn't find out where I had the plus or negative, but it didn't make any sense. I was thinking to myself, well, wait, if friction increases, I would increase the x. It didn't, didn't make any sense, and so I couldn't find out in all my work, and so I said, ah, screw it, and I just erased it and put a negative, and I got full credit. <laughs> okay, so on your exam, if um, your answer doesn't logically make sense, first try to see where the negatives are, but where you may have missed it, but just check yourself. Okay, it takes a two, three second check to make sure, okay, that makes sense, it all logically makes sense, and so chances are you didn't accidentally stumble into the right answer, and so you're more than likely going to be correct. All right, so definitely check yourself. That'd be my last bit of advice. But that's how you do conservation of energy. It really isn't too bad. Join me in the next video, and we'll go ahead and do a problem dealing with work.